Hi, welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about peer review. We have Randy Sheckman here, who is a professor of cell biology here at Berkeley. He's also editor-in-chief of PNAS and is going to be starting a new online open access journal for HHMI, Max Planck Society, and Wellcome Trust. Um, remember to sign in. If you attend eight of our seminars, you'll receive a certificate of completion that goes to fulfilling your NIH requirement for RCR training. And the next session is going to be on mentoring with Lisa Barcelos, and that will be December 5th. Okay, good afternoon. So um, uh, it's true that I've been editor of the PNAS. I actually stepped down about a week ago to uh, start selecting an editorial board for a new journal that you'll be hearing about in the months to come. But I have many experiences in five years at PNAS that I'd like to share with you in a sort of a general way. Uh, and get your reflection on what you consider to be the major issues in uh, publishing a paper. First, let, let me start by asking you how many of you have published a paper? Okay, wow, most of you have. All right, so many of you have experienced some of the things that I've, that I've said, but, but uh, uh, that I'll say, but, but um, there are some in interesting situations that, that arise that you may not have encountered before that, uh, at least from my perspective as an editor, you should be aware of. <coughs> Well, the first thing uh, and probably the most important thing that, that you will uh, be uh, engaged in is assembling the data uh, for publication of a paper. And there are a, a number of issues that I think you should consider when you're doing that. Um, so as you write the text and as you assemble the data for figures in, in the paper, you should be aware of what, uh, what most people will consider issues of plagiarism. Plagiarism is actually a very serious problem in scientific publications, and I think uh, there, there may be differences around the world that aren't commonly held that, that are considered plagiarism. For example, uh, we see, we've seen many examples of papers that are published uh, where whole sections of the paper have been lifted from other papers that are already published. In fact, I've seen examples, I mean, in the extreme form, I've seen examples of papers that were published in one journal and then completely lifted word for word, word and data point for data point, submitted under different names uh, to other journals. That is an obvious case of plagiarism. But even just using, for instance, your own language, you may not have appreciated this, but it's not considered appropriate to take a paragraph from a paper that you've already published and simply reuse the same language in another paper. You should be able to express yourself in a different way. And obviously, you should not be reusing data uh, from one paper to another. Th this is actually a very serious concern. Some people feel it would be appropriate uh, to take data from a paper that they published and simply reuse it uh, to introduce uh, a new, uh, a paper, another paper. Th this is not considered appropriate. And it can cause you a great deal of grief if you attempt to do it, because um, my experience when, when this happens in the literature, there are often people out there, often readers, who scour the literature looking for these sorts of things. And then they send uh, letters to the editor. And the editor then has to investigate. So any data that you publish is uh, unique and should not be reused unless you have prior approval and you're reusing something in a review article. And certainly, you should not borrow data from another paper from someone else's paper or language from another paper and reuse it in your own work. This is really crucial and it can do, do you a lot of harm if it's discovered. And in my experience, especially now in, with the internet, it's, uh, it's in almost uh, expected that such uh, examples of plagiarism, plagiarism will be found. So please be aware of this. Um, so, uh, as I say, original language is, is important. How many of you have encountered this yourself, where you've seen examples in the literature of uh, language that may have been reused in a paper? Can you, maybe you can tell us about your experience. Oh. First identify yourself, and then tell us about the example that you're aware of. Hi, I'm Beth ziegler Ratchless, and I, in my pre-doctoral work, read a lot of papers by uh, an author whose work I really admire, who does uh, molecular modeling of glutamate receptors. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite disappointing to 
read a, a paper and find out that I'm not actually getting any new information yeah. because it's the same thing that was published last year. Yeah, yeah. And when you, when you encountered this, did you send a letter to anybody? Did, did you follow up to find out what may have happened? No, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. So do you think I should send a letter to, well, I, I was a pre-doctoral student. I am yeah. not an established investigator. Yeah. Did, you bring this to the, did, did you bring this to the attention of your mentor? Yes. Uh -huh. And what did he or she do? Uh, we, well, we had a, in lab meeting, the next lab meeting we discussed when it was appropriate to reuse even a single sentence, which is mm -hmm. never, mm -hmm. even of your own, yeah. your own wording. Yeah. And uh, he also said that he too was, was disappointed when this yeah. happened, but yeah. it wasn't uncommon. Yeah. And I talked with another professor who, who thinks that it's entirely appropriate to do this. So Really? Entirely yeah. appropriate to do this? How did this person justify that? It's my writing. I, I made the original wording so I, I can see. use it when I want to. I see. Uh -huh. and, I, and I don't know there was much that I could do, especially well, and not jeopardize my my career or my standing uh, with, so, so with you some were, individuals. You were, you were worried that if you were to uh, bring this up, let's say, to the attention of the editor of that journal, that you would be vulnerable because of that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Did you feel that you could not go to him, that person and ask to be held anonymous uh, to the author uh, if the editor were then to approach the author with that concern? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, I can just tell you, I have had many examples of that where, go ahead and hold this, uh, many examples where uh, uh, someone brings this to my attention, either where data is duplicated. I've seen examples where uh, a group, a particular group will take, for instance, a gel uh, with one set of experiments and simply reuse the same gel with the same bands for an entirely different experiment. And this has been caught and revealed uh, online. And uh, th these people are, uh, you know, I'm often approached by someone who requests anonymity. And I, as an editor, it's no problem for me to keep that anonymous and then to go right to the author and to ask the author uh, to explain. And if an, uh, the explanation is inadequate, then the, the journal will, will very often approach the institution. And the institution is then obliged to conduct an investigation uh, of the author. And you, you can be held anonymous in that uh, without any fear of, uh, of retribution. So two comments. Just one sec. Okay. The, the first is that the, <clears throat> the author whose work I admire is, uh, is Russian and yeah. works in Russia. And I don't know their policies yeah. and their, their viewpoints on responsible conduct of research and whether yeah. this is plagiarism or yeah. not. Yeah. And, and the second is, what if the editor who I approach has a viewpoint more like the second professor who I described? <laughs> Well, and that, you know, it, yeah. it's clear that it's unethical to yeah. publish a gel yeah. with labels that are, you know, clearly yes. not what they uh, purport to be. But, but in a case where people are reusing their own wording or reusing yeah. their own uh, models yeah. in, yeah. in. Well, I consider that plagiarism. If, it, if the attention, if, if when it came to my attention, I, we did something about it. Uh, I believe that other major journals would also consider that plagiarism, and I would find it hard to believe that, uh, that a journal would simply dismiss that as an, uh, as an, uh, an innocent example. Hmm. Um, whenever it's come to my attention and another journal is involved, I often will share this with the editor of the other journal, and action is taken, you know, often resulting in an investigation at the home institution. So you, anyway, the point is you should not be reluctant uh, to approach an editor with that concern because that is, that is a violation of principles and I consider it an international standard. Mm. So um, I'm alarmed to hear what you, what you have to share with us. Yes, identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Uh, Shannon Nulon. I work in Stanford. I'm a, a visiting scholar there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's actually worth looking at the, the legal situation because I think this student has shown an awful lot of courage here. Um, I, copyright law, um, basically, um, it pertains to the expression of particular um, ideas. It's not the same as patent law, okay? So actually you're not violating copyright law 
unless you're actually lifting whole sentences directly. Okay? There's also a provision called fair use, which actually allows you to quote from other people. And that's actually a fair use exception. So, um, with if respect... It's at, if it's attributed. Yeah, if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's attributive, but there are even, even exceptions to that. But, but getting, getting on to P PNAS for a second, my um, understanding of it is in PNAS, um, there is a, you do um, not actually assign copyright to the journal. Isn't, isn't that correct? No, the copyright is held by the author. Okay, so this actually means that legally, okay, let's, let's leave out the um, academic part of this for a second. Mm -hmm. Legally, if you, uh, if you get a paper accepted by PNAS, yeah. legally you can actually use every word of that paper again, if you wish, and you can keep doing so until you have actually assigned copyright. And I think it's worth, before we scare a whole generation of students, just pointing out you're actually not in trouble for doing any of these things. And um, I really want to, want to make that point. Um, the issue, there's a, funda a more fundamental issue here about the whole journal system, which I hope we get to as this talk proceeds. Okay, well, you, 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 you present a very unique attitude that, 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 I've, not, that I've not heard before. It's and, the law. It's yeah. called the law. And, and, and the, exam the examples that have come to my attention, we have prosecuted by investigating the individual. Uh, you you uh, prosecute by in investigating the individual. What you can't do is get the authorities to get the actual uh, federal authorities and the authorities which constitute the body of law in this country to do anything to mm -hmm. the student. And it's mm -hmm. actually worth making that difference. It's a, it's a very, very so, so, so you, you believe that it would be appropriate for an author uh, to reuse data of his own in another paper without, without fear of prosecution? I, I know that uh, unless the author has actually assigned uh, copyright of the data to somebody else, that the author is legally, um, legally able to do whatever he wants uh -huh. there. Now, whether, whether that is actually good academic practice is another matter. And uh, so we've got two different things here. We've got a bunch of students who perhaps invested 10 years in their careers already and are vaguely terrified at this stage. But we also have the law, okay? And the law is actually saying something quite different here. But um, frankly, there are uh, authors out there who published 800 papers. And yeah. I do not believe for a second that they haven't repeated themselves massively throughout uh -huh, those 800 uh -huh. papers. Well, I can tell you, it, when, it comes to my, when it's come to my attention at PNAS, if they've reused data, uh, in another paper without proper attribution, then it's, uh, uh, they are sanctioned and the, the matter is turned over to the investigation of their home institution. And very often they will be reprimanded by the home institution. I think you've, you've made a very important qualification now, which is without proper attribution. Okay? Uh, all right. All right. And, and that actually makes, makes a huge difference. All right. Now, with respect to the home institution, um, there was actually a very interesting case there with the Hauser case in Harvard, where he has Mm -hmm. And I don't actually, it's very hard to qualify to, to comment on this. Um, we have a more fundamental issue here about, about Hauser, which by using federal funds for his research, whether he did in fact violate the law. Uh -huh. And that's, that's much, more, much more fundamental than yeah. the problem. But I think we've, we've brought up the Okay, all right. Well, let, let, me, let me just uh, carry on then, and, and uh, for the benefit of those of you here. Uh, when, when, uh, when someone is, is charged with plagiarism of this sort, using other people's data is often what, what happens, or reusing their own data, and it's turned over to an investigation by the home institution, they, uh, they can impose sanctions on that individual. Uh, and then the matter is often turned over to the Office of Research Integrity at the NIH, where uh, in the event the work is sponsored by the NIH, where they conduct a legal investigation. And now they are uh, slow and ponderous and uh, it takes sometimes years before they finally make a judgment, but, uh, but I've seen cases where they have made judgments uh, against the individual for, usually it's in the case of manipulation of data, not in plagiarism. That's usually the more, the more serious offense. That's the Hauser case. Well, that's one of, one of many examples, yeah. Okay, well, that's fair enough. Was there any other comment on this? I certainly don't mean to frighten you, but I think it's, well, irrespective of what this gentleman says, it's not considered uh, uh, reasonable practice to lift whole paragraphs of your own and reuse them over and over again. That, that would not be considered appropriate. Okay. Now, um, another issue that comes up uh, very often is the use of privileged information 
uh, in the publication process. Uh, so uh, as an example, uh, you um, have done some experiments and you've come to a certain point and then you've relied on private information that's conveyed to you by someone else. Uh, you are not free to simply use that information without proper attribution to the other person. This comes up often in the case of a, of a paper uh, where uh, an author has uh, published something and not cited another individual. Um, we, we at PNAS will, will often get uh, angry letters from those individuals who have not been cited. And this can cause a great deal of uh, difficulty because it becomes a case of he, sh he said versus, versus sh she said. So I think the safest thing is to uh, make sure that when you're uh, doing work and you rely on a private communication from an another individual that you uh, provide that individual an opportunity to review your data and then if he or she provided something essential that you either consider them as a co-author on your paper or that you provide attribution to that person when you write up the paper. Um, so um, another thing that comes up very often, which I feel very strongly about, is in, in, in particularly in biological science, when you do work that uh, results in a publication where you've generated reagents, usually clonal reagents, antibodies, strains, strains of bacteria or yeast or even mice, uh, and you uh, put that into a publication, you imply by the act of publishing that work and describing these reagents that you will then make those available at, for the, at the very least repetition of your experiments uh, by another person who happens to see your paper. This is one of the most frequent complaints that I've received at PNAS. When an author uh, publishes a paper uh, providing, you know, identifying particular reagents that others would find useful and then uh, they don't make them available to another individual after publication. As, uh, 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 even e years later, and I, I'll give you an example of, yes, you, know, um, you have to use this. Uh, Samuel Marenblum, I'm a postdoc in the Williams Group. Um, how does that work for instrumentation? So for a group that has exclusive rights or they're the only ones that have built an instrument, um, are they implying the ability for a researcher to come and use it? Uh, well, that's, that's probably more difficult. Um, if, if, the, if you built an instrument and the instrument is described in the publication, then the procedures should be repeatable for producing this instrument. That doesn't mean that you have to uh, package the instrument and send it off to somewhere else. But if you, uh, I think it would be appropriate if you have such an instrument and someone wishes to use it to do the same experiment or it can, it continue along that line to make it available. But I don't know that you have to uh, um, you certainly you don't have to produce the instrument for someone else's use, but sharing it certainly would be appropriate. But you know, this applies mo um, more routinely to clonal reagents, which are easy to replicate. Uh, biological reagents, clones, antibodies, strains that take little if no effort to simply streak out on a plate use. and send to somebody else. So an instrument is, is you know, another, another problem. Let me give you an example of uh, an extreme case that I encountered several years ago at PNAS. The, an author um, uh, at a biotech company created a, a yeast strain uh, and re really quite laboriously replaced all of the yeast genes that are responsible for the addition of an oligosaccharide to a glycoprotein so that th this yeast strain would produce human glycans, human oligosaccharides on heterologous proteins expressed in yeast. Um, this individual was using a, a specialized yeast strain for which there was patent protection that was not revealed in the, in the publication. Um, he then, several years after his publication, uh, sold his company to Merck, and Merck would no longer abide by any agreement that he may have made before uh, when he published the paper. So years later, I discovered that he uh, was not making the strains available when I confronted him with this and the implication that these strains should be made available, he said, uh, I don't have the strains anymore. I sold the company to Merck. I literally couldn't go into my freezer and provide these strains in any case. Then I asked him, what about the years before he sold the company to Merck? And he said, well, the strain was protected by a patent 
that was binding and uh, that he had, had requests for the strain but couldn't, uh, couldn't supply them. So in fact, this individual had agreed to publish the paper uh, and had created strains that he s could never have provided to anyone outside of his own laboratory. So um, as a result of that, he was sanctioned by the journal. He was uh, sanctioned for a period of several years and his paper is now online watermarked with, uh, with, a, with a big f red flag uh, that uh, people who read this paper should be aware that these strains are, uh, are not being provided in violation of journal policy. So that's a really very serious sanction. Yes? So in this case, he should not have published the paper? Absolutely not. He should not have published the paper. Had I known that, this, uh, uh, that he uh, was engaged in this kind of activity and that the strains would, not, would never be made available, we would not have accepted the paper. Um, and so we've, we've developed new policies that uh, require that the author check a box saying that these reagents will be made available. And so uh, I don't know if that has any more, I mean, I couldn't then charge him in court and his institution was unwilling invest to investigate. But at least now if, he's, if somebody checks a box saying that they will be making these available, they're, they're, you know, they're guilty of a, some higher violation. I think it's hard to charge these people, but that was a very serious violation. And I see this kind of thing all the time. Oh, yes. Uh, what about cases where uh, authors don't share data? So often yeah. I'll read papers in Lancet or New England Journal of Medicine, uh, clinical trial papers, yeah. and think, wow, I really want to see if they controlled for this. Yeah. Or I want to analyze the data in, in this way. And I'm not an epidemiologist, yeah. and this isn't my field, but I like to play with the data. Yeah. There's no way to get from, from pharmaceutical companies these yeah. data. Yeah. yeah, this is a very serious issue. Um, we, uh, again, at PNAS, we have a policy of requiring authors to share all information with qualified investigators. Now, we say qualified because we have uh, s several instances where papers, particularly uh, in the in areas of the environment and public health, where, where uh, outside uh, interests intervene to request uh, volumes of data that individuals simply can't produce. We had a case of a, a paper in PNAS that was published several years ago where somebody was drilling ice cores in the Arctic and measuring CO2 content going back thousands of years. And there was a blogger in Canada who's not a scientist who simply wanted all the samples, wanted you know, all the data that uh, this person had collected over a period of years, and it was basically amounted to a case of harassment. So we did not aid that person in this pursuit, but in other cases we will if we feel that a qualified author has, has made a, a reasonable request. So I don't know about medical journals and the uh, papers that are published by pharmaceutical companies, but that, that I can see that would be a very serious problem. I mean, here's another example, apropos of what you've said, We've had papers submitted to the PNAS where often contributed by a member of the National Academy with certain privileges in publishing in the PNAS. And they, uh, in, in a couple of instances, talk about a reagent that they produced, uh, a biologically active compound that they've synthesized, but where they are un unwilling to share uh, the either the composition or the structure of such an agent. And we are unwilling to publish a paper of that sort if, if, they, are, if they can't produce the chemical, the structure of the chemical, if they have that information, then they can't publish the paper. I, I think that's a very strong principle that we abide by, and I think many other journals uh, do as well. OK, any other points? These are really interesting discussion points. OK, so uh, now another issue that comes up uh, very often, and this is a more difficult one, is uh, uh, whether all data relevant to a paper must be provided in the paper. Uh, many years ago, the tradition was for an experiment that wasn't considered vital to the bottom line of a paper, an author would say, data not shown. And then uh, uh, about 15 years ago, certain journals started to take the attitude that anything germane to the paper had to be included in the, paper, in the text of the paper. So uh, part of that has, result, that has resulted in part in the proliferation of supplemental information. So many of you will see 
you know, you see a paper published in Science or Nature, the paper itself is two or three pages, and then the supplement can be uh, 50 figures and, uh, you know, dozens of pages. And it's often because of the insistence that data be, be provided. And uh, this, you know, in some ways is a valuable trend. In other ways, I think it often confuses the literature. So uh, this, uh, I think this is now a matter of personal taste. Most people now simply put all this data not shown or data wa that wasn't going to be shown in the, in the supplement. Now, the problem with, the, with um, the proliferation of supplements is that very few people actually read all the supplements. And I've experienced as a journal editor the problem that referees will not read all of the supplementary information. And so we've seen in cases that have turned up later on that some of the material in the supplements is uh, not, as, um, uh, not as well controlled as primary data in the paper. So this is a real serious issue. It's in fact, some, there are some fa famous cases of data manipulation where the images that were in the supplement were the things that really uh, tripped up the paper. The primary images in the body of the paper were fine, but the images in the supplement were really what uh, caused suspicion and turned out to prove that the data were fraudulent. Okay, um, so now you've assembled the paper. Uh, it's all original language. The data has not been published anywhere else before. And uh, you're ready to submit the paper uh, to uh, PNAS, for example. Uh, and, but you're concerned about competitors. This is a quite natural concern. Uh, who out there uh, might be doing the same thing that you wouldn't wish to have review your paper? I, I think it's perfectly reasonable as an author to ask that the editor avoid the use of one or two individuals. It's not appropriate to make a list of all your competitors and tell them to be ex excluded. I'll give you two extreme examples. Uh, some years ago, I was handling a paper from a Canadian author uh, who asked, uh, who suggested, of course, several people that would be appropriate. But then he said, uh, oh, and by the way, please don't send this paper to anyone else in Canada. <laughs> And then I had another example of the same situation where an author from Italy said that he didn't want his paper to be reviewed by anyone else in Italy. That, that of course, is not a reasonable request, but I think it is reasonable to ask uh, that major competitors be excluded. Now, the problem is that I can tell you at PNAS that we do our best to avoid the use of competitors if they are named, but we can't possibly know all the others who may be in a competitive situation who have not been named by you as the author. Uh, I can also say, regrettably, that other journals may not be quite as scrupulous in avoiding uh, the use of people that you list as inappropriate. Uh, and I think that's a, a bad policy on the part of those journals, but, um, but I'm afraid it happens. So it's certainly appropriate to suggest people that you wish to have con you, uh, consider your paper and appropriate to list a few who are not. Um, on the topic of people Why don't you, you identify yourself. Oh, uh, Mikhail Shapiro, I'm a Miller fellow here. Um, on the topic of people you wish to have, if you have consulted with somebody for um, some aspect of the paper who's not an author, but they yeah. might be in your acknowledgements, for example, does yeah. that disqualify them from being a reviewer, even though they might be like the perfect well, if person? Well, if, you, if you've done that, typically you, will, you would list that person in the acknowledgement section. It would then be up to the editor of the paper to consider whether that was appropriate. You might mention that in your cover letter that I consulted this person, he was not involved in the investigation, but um, he's aware of the work. And if the, if it really at that point it's up to the editor. How, do you guys, how did you guys generally handle that? Uh, uh, well, I th you know, at PNS there were 180 members of the editorial board, so I think people have different attitudes about it. Um, I think it's perfectly appropriate. I mean, after all, we are a collegial community. It's very often that you would consult somebody about something or they would provide reagents, <clears throat> but they wouldn't necessarily have an intimate role in your work. So I, I think that's perfectly appropriate. Now, on the other hand, th there's another kind of conflict of interest, and that is um, you may uh, list as a, as a possible referee uh, a current collaborator of yours who may not be an author on the paper or, who, or recent mentor of yours, some, something like that. If you have such a relationship with someone, I think it's appropriate to uh, indicate that in the cover letter, um, but because the editor may not be aware of this. And I can tell you instances of this at PNAS. We've had, I had cases where back when members of the National Academy could communicate on behalf of another author, I had two instances. One where 
um, a member of the Academy communicated a paper of his daughter's, uh, uh, and, and he was shocked to hear that that was considered inappropriate. I wouldn't have known this <coughs> were it not for the fact that a member of the editorial board uh, knew that this was a father-daughter team, <laughs> actually in different research areas. I had another case where a, a, a member of the Academy com a, a co communicated a paper on behalf of his wife, who happened to have a, a different last name. And it was only because I knew the two of them that I was aware of this. It was completely inappropriate. Um, so, I mean, but that's maybe a special circumstance of the PNS. So if you have such a connection, you should, it should be made aware. Um, but, you know, it's impossible to con control for all these relationships that the editor may not be aware of. Okay. So let's now, uh, are there other questions about, maybe before I move on, are there any questions about the submission process? What's, what you would consider to be appropriate data to include or who you would suggest as a referee? Yes. My name is Lee McGuire, I'm in uh, Dan Feldman's lab. Um, I'm just curious about the reanalysis of previously published data. So, yeah. for instance, if you're in a field where large data sets are collected over, yes. like, at the course of years, yes. if you conduct a, an entirely new analysis yes. on data that's previously been published, is that... Oh, I think, like, that, I think that would be entirely appropriate, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, now in the, in the era of open access literature, it'll become increasingly common for that to occur, and I think it's a good thing about open access. If all the data can be searchable, uh, infinitely searchable when it's open access, then the opportunity to reevaluate data will be even more common. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Yes. It's a situation that's currently happening now. I, I work in neuroscience, and there are currently um, neuroscience data sets being produced here in Berkeley uh, from um, on the basis of patients who are undergoing uh, yeah. surgery yeah. and uh, neurosurgery. Now, um, they're publishing papers based on yeah. these yeah. and they're refusing to share that data. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, the um, grounds they say is that the patients haven't given official yeah. uh, explicit p permission, yeah. but yet um, they have shared the data with yeah. some of the more prestigious um, places like uh, Stanford, um, the neuroscience department there. Yeah. Um, do you think that that is uh, an ethical position on I, their part? No, I don't. I think okay. if data is published, it should be it should be available to uh, other qualified investigators. Uh, but if you know, when it, there's a special circumstance that applies to human subjects, uh, they have to be uh, given the opportunity to provide uh, explicit consent when the data is published. But once it's published seems to me, as long as the, as the identity of the individual is protected, that it should be, it should be shared. Yeah, I, I found your answer there very helpful. It's, it's not really ethical or appropriate. I don't think so. I don't yeah. think it is. Now, there, there, is, there are some unusual circumstances that I've encountered at PNAS where um, DNA sequencing, deep genome sequencing of human DNA uh, is uh, submitted for publication without necessarily informed consent by, uh, by patients. And um, uh, uh, even though the identity of the patients was, was withheld uh, in, in the publication, the, the, the mere fact that the DNA sequence were being uh, published uh, uh, could, could potentially subject the patient to scrutiny by other individuals, you know, insurance companies. So in fact, uh, we have a great deal of difficulty uh, with the publication of that kind of information. Uh, and I think in a particular paper from another institution, we didn't allow the paper to be published because they were including what, what might be considered private information about uh, from human subjects. So that's something to cons be concerned about. Yes. So wait, wait for the microphone. It, for data sharing, when, do you have a guideline or a set of guidelines that you think that demonstrate when uh, a, an investigator who is sharing reagents or mice or data uh, should be a co-author on the paper. Yeah, so that, there, okay, there are yeah. cases where in, yeah. in my pre-doctoral yeah. institution we were trying to get 
a mouse and part of the contract for using yeah. this mouse was yeah. Yeah, this, after 20 years after the original publication describing this mouse yeah. was that the yeah. the generator be a co-author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that, that, that's, a, that's a tough issue. I, um, uh, I've seen instances of that and uh, where the author is unwilling to make the other person a co-author. I, I, I think it's a very difficult situation. I don't know that there's anything that a journal can, can impose to adjudicate that kind of, a, of an interaction. My, my own personal position is that uh, if, if a reagent has already been published, you know, even a difficult mouse construction, that uh, the, the person who's then obliged to provide that strain need not be included as a co-author uh, on, on another paper. Now, if the work was done in a laboratory but not yet published to create that strain, then obviously it sh uh, that per the, the person who did the work to create the strain should be considered a co-author. But if it's already been published, I don't personally consider that uh, necessary. Uh, but we were actually we were willing to share our authorship, but we never did get the mouse. I see. I see. Really? So this was a mouse that was published somewhere else? Well, yes. once again, did you... Uh, avail yourself the opportunity to consult the uh, editor of this journal? My mentor did. Yes, and what did, the, what did the journal do? It encouraged the author to share the mouse. Encouraged? <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, so obviously that was ineffective. Indeed. Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, the a journal can be, more, uh, can be more effective than simply to encourage. They can sanction the author if, if they're unwilling to provide strains. And, and I was fully prepared to do that in several instances. If the strain was not made available after having been published, we would put a great deal of pressure on the author of the first paper to provide that, uh, including possible sanctions, letters, letters to his or her chair, or to the home institution. And usually that, uh, that encouraged them to cooperate. Okay, all right. So uh, now uh, let's go on to the sort of complementary issue, what, what one faces when, when you're asked to review a paper or to edit a paper. So um, if you are asked to uh, review a paper, uh, that paper is, uh, is uh, privileged information. You agree to serve as a referee under the, and, and, and the implicit obligation you have is that you will not then discuss this with other people. You will not make copies of the manuscript to share with other individuals uh, and anything, any violation of that is considered inappropriate. Um, the other uh, thing that comes up is someone's asked to review a paper and they're in a position of uh, conflict of interest. They have, they're doing experiments of this sort. They have a personal relationship with, uh, with the author in question. The editor may not be aware of that. Still, it is the obligation of the referee or the editor if, it's, if this person is asked to handle a paper, to make those relationships or that conflict of interest known to, uh, to the editor. And the editor, if, if he's doing his job, will then thank the author, thank the editor and the reviewer and excuse them from service. So what happens when there's a violation of that? There are lots of stories, many cases, where a competitor not known to the uh, author of the paper or not known to the editor the paper is assigned to an individual. They use that information, that privileged information, inappropriately to advance their own work. It's really very difficult to prove that, but um, I have had several cases where um, a referee subsequently turns up uh, having published a paper on the same subject uh, as the uh, individual who, whose paper that they handled. And, and we, when we learn about that, we first off ask the referee to explain him or herself. Uh, and if the explanation is, is, um, is not an innocent expl explanation, then uh, we can uh, sanction that individual. Uh, we can go to the, his or her chair or to the home department and ask for an investigation. So that, that kind of conflict of interest is considered very serious. So if, you're, uh, if you find yourself in that circumstance where you have a paper, you've been asked to review a paper, where you are working on the same subject, you should simply excuse yourself and say, and, and, and say I'm not willing to do this, and ask somebody else. If you find yourself in the opposite situation where privileged information has been used by someone else uh, and your work is uh, held up or someone else publishes, then I think it's appropriate for you to approach the 
editor of the journal that you've submitted the paper to with a, with a challenge. Now, very difficult sometimes to investigate these cases, but I think it is, it, it's certainly within your rights to, to do that. So this is uh, really important for the integrity of science that we all uh, play by the rules and not take advantage. There are, there are uh, very unfortunate si situations where we've encountered um, PNAS and other journals where someone who is in a competitive situation uh, is asked to review a paper and then holds onto the paper, sometimes for weeks or months. Now, a journal that's doing its job will not allow a referee to sit on a paper for more than a few weeks, but sometimes the editor goes away on vacation or things fall through the cracks. Papers sit on someone's desk, sometimes with really deliberate malicious intent, and uh, it can really damage the, uh, uh, the, the author's uh, opportunity to publish his work. So um, in, in any violation of that policy that you become aware of, you should immediately go to the editor of the paper or to the editor of the journal with your experience, and usually they can do something about it. Have anybody ever found themselves in such a situation? Yeah. I had a different question. Yeah, but, well, but anybody ever found themselves in such a situation? Fortunately not, okay. Howard, you probably have. Yeah. <laughs> you care to share your experience on such matter? Well, I, I, there's nothing much you can do other than complain to the editor that this yeah. has happened. Yeah. And uh, as you said, it's very difficult to prove. Yeah. But what my experience has been as an editor, not personal experience. And the frequently when I get complaints of, well, I got complaints of that sort, yeah. it was that another, that the reviewer had in his or her desk drawer an unpublished manuscript which they weren't quite sure of until they read the paper they were reviewing. Yeah. And as soon as they read the paper they were reviewing, immediately <laughs> they opened the bottom drawer and took their paper out and published it. Yeah. And then the author of the paper to be reviewed yeah. complained that their work was stolen. Yeah. It, and it's a very sad story, but yeah. it happens. This is a, yeah. a competitive world. It's very, and, yeah. uh, it's very hard to prove malicious intent. Absolutely. Very hard. Yes, you have a comment at this point, and I'll come back yeah, to you. And, and if there is a delay like that, um, surely the smart thing to do is to put the paper up on your own website. Don't you think? To put the paper, which, yeah. which paper? The paper, the paper, that, the paper you've submitted a paper, yeah. you suspect skullduggery. Yeah. Surely the smart thing to do is to actually just put it straight up on your own website uh -huh. and actually uh, date stamp it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that may help if people are routinely uh, tr trawling through your website to find your papers. But, you know, presumably one publishes work to make it more highly visible than, than having something on your personal website. If we find, I mean, I can tell you at PNAS, this may not be true at some of the other journals, but... Um, if, uh, if an author is, um, let's say, an, a paper on a competing subject comes out in some other journal, uh, if it's within a short period of time, even if it's not an inappropriate situation, if it's within a short period of time and an author comes to us saying that they've done the experiments at the same time or whatever, we will consider the paper as long as it's within a reasonable period of time. Something that's six months or a year later, uh, you know, you're out of luck. Um, I don't know that I've had a situation where an author feels that they've been, their work has been held up by someone else and then they've come back to us insisting that we publish it. But I would consider if I felt that there was some reasonable uh, just cause there. You had a question. Why don't you identify yourself first? My name is Prof. Ariel. I'm a postdoc in the MCB. Um, I had a question about delegation of reviewing. Yeah. So, um, Sometimes, you know, uh, PIs, are, PIs have a ton of reviewing to do, yep. and then so they delegate some of their uh, reviewing to postdocs or to grad students. Yeah. And, um, I, I mean, I could see it both ways. One is that, you know, like that is a time for learning for the, yeah. the, uh, the postdocs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if, if it was review, if it's, you know, g gone to review to a particular uh, professor, yeah. then they should yeah. review it. So what is the policy? Well, that, okay, so that's a, that's a fair question. Everybody hear that. Um, uh, this happens to me, I'm sure it happens to a lot of us. Um, when, when, when as a PI you're asked to referee a paper and you wish to have one of your students or postdocs do it, I, I feel it's your obligation to ask the editor if that's, if that's permitted. So I will always do that if, if I get something. I'll ask the editor, can I have my postdoc who's working on this, in this area 
review the paper, and if the editor says that's fine, then I'll do that. But by transferring it to that person, I'm not relieving myself of the responsibility to take the final, make the final decision on the paper. I will always then consult with the postdoc and discuss what he or she has found, and then help them write the review. And I will the, then that postdoc or graduate student assumes the same obligations to not to keep the information confidential, to not take advantage of it, to not photocopy it, to not share it around to other people. So, but I think it's perfectly acceptable, provided the editor uh, agrees. Sometimes an editor will say, no, I'll just go to somebody else. Any other questions on this? OK. OK, so um, uh, uh, probably my most common experience in, in, uh, as, a, as an editor relates to all the subjects that we've discussed is post-publication conflict. So um, uh, conflicts come of, of, of various sorts, of the sorts that we've described, where someone accuses another person of having stolen their data, taken advantage of uh, pre-publication communication. Uh, but often, uh, post-publication conflict comes in the form of a disagreement in the interpretation of data or in the adequacy of experiments that have been published. Uh, for this reason, when I, when I started as editor at PNS, we started a feature a letter to the editor where if a paper is published w within three months of publication, someone who disputes the claim of an author uh, or the reliability of the data on which a conclusion is based is free to write a, write a, a letter, and th that letter will then be considered by the same editor who handled the paper in the first place. So I think that's a good, a really good safety valve, and it provides an opportunity, provided that the letter writer is being reasonable and not, uh, not ballistic in his attitudes about it. No, no ad hominem attacks are allowed in letters to the editor. I think it's a reasonable safety valve and allows a discourse on, on papers. But <clears throat> unfortunately, the more common thing is, is where someone has claimed um, that uh, there's been some inappropriate action in acquiring the data. And this becomes, again, very difficult to investigate. Um, we will, if we feel that it's reasonable, uh, that the reasonable case is made, but it's an unusual situation. Uh, we often will have people who feel that uh, their the most common complaint is that an author feels that his work was not cited properly in the, in the published paper or, you know, the right citation or it was completely ignored. Uh, um, as our policy is that we can't police uh, all of the reference lists uh, on papers. We try, whenever there's a dispute of this sort, we try to get the, um, the author of the paper and the person to get together to try to sort, sort it out themselves. Uh, sometimes the person who's writing the letter is anonymous to us and wishes to remain anonymous to the author, and then in which case we can't really do much. But most often the cases are reasonable and then we ask the, the author and the letter writer to get together. So there are many situations that arise of this sort, and uh, uh, this is <clears throat> most often the, 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 how I've spent my time as an editor dealing with post-publication conflicts. All right, so um, in the, I guess we have just a few minutes. Um, there are some interesting exercises that have been provided to me I thought I'd read to you and see what you think about uh, uh, what a person might do. Um, see what were the ones well actually many of these themes we've already touched on all right let, let me read the first the first test case here Jane is a very motivated and bright graduate student who is trying hard to purify a protein in a highly specialized area of research despite her perseverance she meets with failure after failure finally she goes to her PI Dr. Smith who is an internationally recognized investigator in Jane's research and confesses her problem. The PI is silent for a while and then says, don't fret, I'll have something for you to look at tomorrow. The following day, when Jane arrives at the lab, she sees an unpublished manuscript on her desk with a post-it note that says, read the methods and results section of this paper. I think they might contain the solution to your problems, but don't tell anybody I gave you this. As soon as you're finished, return the paper to me and don't make any copies of it. The paper describes an experiment that seems exactly suited to solving Jane's problem. 
And sure enough, within a few days, Jane is purified using the, the protein using this approach. She gleefully reports all this to her PI and returns the paper. She can't help asking, though, Dr. Smith, I've searched the literature high and low to find a method to help me with my project and found absolutely nothing. Where did you get that manuscript? To which Dr. Smith obliquely replies, oh, I've got a ton of them. What would your reaction be to, to a situation? For inst first of all, if you, were the, uh, if you were Jane, how would you react if your mentor gave you a, what looks like a preprint from someone else? What, given what we've discussed, what would be the appropriate action for you to take? Well, I guess I'd, I'd be really disappointed, especially if I worked for a long time on that project because I would feel like I had to switch to a different project because in, in which I didn't have to use that information. No. Or because otherwise I might have figured it out on my own. It might have taken me several months. No. But at least I could have used the information. No. And no. I suppose I would feel comfortable anonymously notifying the editor that probably the re that reviewer should not yeah. Uh, but you, of course, Dr. Used. Smith wouldn't have given you the journal, so you wouldn't have known where this paper had been submitted. Suppose, but uh, you can always find out later yeah. when you read the paper yeah. in a journal. Yeah. All right. Here's a here's one scenario uh, on this theme that l that's maybe a little different than you might have guessed. Um, what if the paper has already been ex accepted for publication and will appear soon? Would that well, how would that change how you might have treated the data that? Your, your mentor had given to you? I don't think it would have. Okay, so that's, the, that's, I think, the right answer. Just because it's in press doesn't mean that the author of the paper had permitted your mentor to share the data with you. It would be, uh, it really, it's inappropriate to use data unless the author of the paper has expressly permitted that data to be shared, that information to be shared with you. Um, and, on, and only then, if the paper is in press, I think it's appropriate for the author to permit you to do it, but it is certainly not appropriate for your mentor to uh, take advantage of that. Well, one other scenario, some more, yes, you have a. Uh, my name is Maurizio Pellegrino. I'm also a postdoc here at MCB. Uh, why isn't the review process double blind? Why yeah. doesn't what, I don't know. Double blind, by double blind, do you mean that the authors of the paper are, are, uh, are obscured? The identity of the authors of the paper are not right. shared with the referee? Yeah, right. that's an interesting point. It was, uh, was suggested to me that in the new journal that I'm starting that I consider that as a, as a policy. Well, I, I think as a matter of practice, it's very difficult to, uh, particularly for, for senior investigators who've been in a field for a long time, to obscure their identity from a paper. I mean, uh, uh, I, I know for, for all the people in my field, the senior, the senior authors, if they, even if you were to remove all the names from the paper, I would know instantly who they were because A, they'd be citing mostly themselves, and B, I'd know from the style of the work, and C, I'd certainly know from the subject of the work who it was. So, so I, I'm not sure that's, uh, that's such a good idea. It may only serve to the disadvantage of someone who's entered the field uh, and is, is, you know, hasn't contributed to that field yet. Yes, in the back. Okay. Um, follow up on that. Um, but it would surely help the junior investigator who hasn't been in the field for a long time to have the option to obscure his name. Don't you agree I'm with that? Not, I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure it's true. Uh, I mean, you know, we haven't done the experiment, so I'm. Maybe somebody should. <laughs> somebody, somebody should do it. Some other at some other journal. Yeah. I. <laughs> I, I think, it, I mean, the, the concern, uh, the basis of the concern, which is c often express, is expressed, is that big shots in the field have an easier time getting their work published. They, you know, they, they submit a paper to sell, you know, they're famous. Uh, I actually don't believe that's true. Uh, I, I think that uh, very often the most uh, um, senior famous people in the field, uh, if a paper is sent to some junior colleague uh, at some other institution, they're looking for an opportunity, I think, all too, altogether too often, to shoot down the big shots. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that it works to the favor of the senior person, uh, one way or the other, whether it's their name is there or it's, or it's not there. Uh, can I ask another question that's yeah. maybe related to that? Why don't you identify that? yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is Garrett Maus. I'm a postdoc in psychology. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen 
a review as an editor which you think is widely inappropriate that that uses like ad hominem attacks to the authors uses or say what uses that, that uses uh, ad hominem yes, attacks on the yeah, authors yeah. and and what would you do as an editor yeah, would you okay. would you send it back to the author or would yeah. did you ever like uh, we, we've edited we have at pnas we if we see such inappropriate language we edit the remarks to remove ad hominem attacks <laughs> and we just do it whatever whatever the author of the refer uh, whether the referee has approved or not we will not we don't need to inflame the authors of a paper with in inappropriate language in their referee remarks. Sometimes, it's the, sometimes the remarks are so inappropriate that we will strike the, the remarks altogether and not send them. But that, that's unusual. Um, the more usual situation is, uh, you know, this was a dumb experiment and, you know, this kind of thing. So we, we strike that language um, without necessarily, tone, you know, removing the intent of the, of the referee. Have you seen Critiques th of that sort, really well. It's really unfortunate. the The editor of that paper was not doing his or her job. Okay. Well, uh, were we supposed to go longer than this, or no? Okay. All right. Good luck in publishing your work. <laughs>